um, for everyone who I can't see but can see all your initials at the base of the screen. Um, I know you've heard some amazing um, talks from designers in various stages of their career and within various pockets of the industry over the last term. And I guess today my talk will be around being a sole trader and a freelance industrial designer or at least the transition that I undertook from uh, full-time work to freelance. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll track my career path and hopefully sort of talk about some points on or insights on what led me to freelancing and also how I've um, managed to become comfortable operating within that space and uh, be somewhat successful um, because it certainly presents a number of challenges on a, a daily basis being a, a freelancer and um, so maybe my talk can touch on some of those pros and cons a bit later on but obviously the first one uh, is income instability and how you can manage that with the rest of your life um, along with things like working in you know a design solo in in some aspect we'll sort of mention my white walled prison that I usually work out of um, so it's about how to tackle that and how to overcome those kind of things um, so what I'll also do is I might just bring up some pictures as I talk I might share screen every now and again um, so I'll just jump in and out of that and they're not, you know, I've just sort of thrown this together so don't judge me on the presentation but the idea is, is it might just sort of help, uh, it might sort of help the talk be interesting but also allow a showcase of a career arc um, so there might be some scribbles and photos and material exploration and things like that. Um, and on a note of that too, the uh, being a freelancer in terms of showing work there is also um, significant challenges when people uh, or clients um, ask for NDAs and non-disclosure agreements. So a, a lot of my favourite work I can't even show to you and um, it's it's how, you know, is that something you feel comfortable being a part of in the design process, all the hard work um, that you put into a project and you can't even claim it as your own or you can't showcase it as your own, at least without significant, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, approval I guess at certain stages and then how that sort of tracks 15 years later into your career how do you go back to seek approval for something by someone who's not even in that position anymore so there's lots of challenges um, but in terms of what I do uh, the quick snapshot is that I work with creative consultancies and manufacturers and principal clients to translate their ideas into the built environment and um, generally what that means uh, is this design for spaces. So, you know, I work mainly in, you know, the construction and engineering field in, in some respect. Um, but I, and I have a passion for sculpture and public art and architecture. And that sort of has helped me, helped lead me to where I am today. And really what I try and do is I try and bridge that gap between the artist and the manufacturer, um, you know, to assist the dialogue, uh, to ensure that the artist's intent is maintained. Um, but that it also has an achievable outcome for the client and is achievable for the manufacturer too. So there's this there's this gap in between the two sometimes, um, and I, that's sort of my niche pocket that I sit into. And so to assist their dialogue, what I mean is uh, I do it visually to document the idea through the standard you know design process that you all know of of concept and design development and con construction documentation. Um, so there's elements of you know, there's a combination of style forming, styling and form studying, um, but also it's it's fairly heavy on technical knowledge and detailing because that's what you need for the pra practical application of these ideas. Um, so I guess my 15 years experience doing this uh, allows me to sort of bolt onto companies as I need to, to contribute to various stages throughout project phases. Um, and I kind of feel comfortable in, you know, going from planning to implementation as well, although I, you know, love being in the concepts, concept stage of it as well. Um, so I graduated from RMIT, uh, RMIT in 2004. And while I was at uni, I was more passionate about, you know, furniture design, spatial projects, exhibition and lighting and sculpture, uh, rather than pure product design. Um, and I guess my career path has sort of stayed, you know, in that way or on that manner. Um, so leaving uh, RMIT, I landed a, a job at a Melbourne based company with national and international offices and reach based in Melbourne um, that specialised in managing built brand assets for mainly large corporate retailers and um, or government organisations. And you know, the o overarching word to describe that is branded environments. And so what that means is, as we all sort of touched on, it's typically signage. 
uh, but it also means that it spreads out over a number of number of disciplines and that includes um, retail design infrastructure basic product design you know even building works for commercial for commercial buildings facades and things like that um, so the idea i guess what it means is that anywhere that the brand was represented in the physical world and had a built form uh, then it had to be designed and manufactured and installed and had ongoing management to it, which was part of the, the, co the company offering, you know, in terms of maintenance and um, archiving and, and all those kind of things. So an example of this could be that um, a large corporate organization like a bank does a rebrand. Um, and so that permeated across all their assets from you know, sky signs hanging off buildings in the CBD um, to, to the branches that you walk into, um, you know, with interior works and sort of down to products like ATMs and other sort of touchscreen devices and whatnot. Um, as Will said, there's also sort of wayfinding and strategy involved for um, signage within commercial buildings and also sometimes more excitingly um, interpretive uh, wayfinding and signage for natural landscapes and, and park lands and boardwalks and, and how you could bring sort of some of that interesting materiality into it too. There's also public infrastructure too, which I've worked on. Um, but essentially, I enjoyed this spot I was in because uh, I had a real appreciation of graphic design. Don't judge me on the, the document you're going to see a bit later on. Um, but, you know, as and as mentioned, sculpture and architecture. And it all, it all seemed like this space sort of, it all amalgamated quite neatly into this built brand space. Um, so when I came in, which was about 15 years ago, I felt it was quite an interesting time in the industry as well. Um, it, it felt like the industry was transitioning in a transition phase uh, with new technologies coming on board. Even back then, we were talking about 3D printing for rapid prototyping, not necessarily for products, but that was you know 15 years ago. Um, and even down to as simply as fluorescent tubes were on their way out and LEDs were on their way in. So. You know, it sounds like a simple thing, but what that meant for signage design was that a transition from this large rectangular pylon, um, you know, sort of a blight on a building uh, to being more intricate and individu individualized designs that better represented, you know, the company you were working for. So I'd gone from that gaudy rectangular glowing box on some beautiful uh, piece of architecture to being integrated within the architecture and, uh, you know, resonating the surroundings in terms of form material and finish uh, and and because of that it also opened up a whole um you know all the other avenues that went on into you know retail experience and all and product design and whatnot so um so an example i guess is you know if you're working on a a car dealership um not that i've worked on audi but if you just think of them for instance that brand sort of permeates across the entire retail brand experience so as soon as you enter the site there's obviously pylons and building signage but um, think about the facade, the, the unique sort of uh, metal mesh um, facade work that they've done, all the way down to the custom bollards that they use too. So brand isn't just a logo, it's really, uh, you know, the, the branding becomes an experience within that space. Um, <clears throat> so all of those things are about how we translated brand into the built environment and sort of how we told stories, uh, communicated the brand narrative and connected um, the design that we were working on to people and place and space. Um, so on a day-to-day -day basis at the company, you know, there was it was heavy on documentation. A lot of the times, um, external brand consultancies had come up with the the logo, and it was it was up to us to to figure out how it could be built and detailed. And there was an opportunity to add value in that space too. Um, so I might just share screen quickly while I talk. I um, hope you can see that. So uh, this is just some sketches that was part of the initial proposal for Commonwealth Bank. Now, this is just one of the, the options here, but um, I worked with a team of designers. Um, Tony Gleski was a graphic designer. Stuart Jacobs was another industrial designer. And really what it uh, enabled us to do was um, sort of play with the form or reestablish or reimagine what the the actual Commonwealth Bank logo was through these new technologies, applying processes like injection molding. Um, so coming, going through from form studying to prototyping, um, things like custom extrusions as well was also part of the process. And so once we sort of delivered this stage, this was, uh, as I said, not the accepted concept, but there's four others pretty much like this in terms of sketch and design. Um, we translated that into 
documentation so that we could maintain a consistent look of what we had developed across the entire network of, of signs and branches. And it bled down into you know, all the sign types, graphic variations, and then into in more interesting aspects like the, the custom ATMs, exploring material and, and lighting and, and how we could sort of bring sort of new ideas to that. Um, so another sort of a more commercial building based design was this one was sort of wayfinding and strategy for the AXA headquarters and really more about large scale signage integration into facade works. And also, I, I guess here the, the, the key at the time was AXA had this red line, which sort of permeated the whole brand experience. So it was about how that could become a wayfinding device and work its way through the building and then also become other sort of more sculptural aspects like um, this is there was a few um, voids within the building and these became sort of canopy shading for the workers beneath sort of sculptural tilted um, red aspects going back to that that idea of brand permeating things like the car dealership um, all the way down from you know, working on the just the logos and the signs to developing small product elements um, as well and then again on the product, sort of moving into the retail space, coming up with sketches and designs and working with people internationally. Um, so there's obviously things we needed to consider like the communication um, barrier, uh, but also the, the amazing skill sets that sort of international um, companies could bring to it. We could provide sketches and all of a sudden we would have back prototypes that they'd built from the sketches too. So that was quite an, an amazing experience. Uh, I think this was done maybe in 2007, but I imagine New Balance shoes may have done a, a full circle and could even be wearing them again now. Uh, and then also doing things like exhibition design too, which was quite fantastic. This was all, you know, coming into a company that I thought was purely based on signage and then uh, being able to work on all these amazing um, projects that really uh, were my skill set or, or where I wanted to be as well. Um, so I will unshare screen for a tick. Uh, I guess, so I worked seven years within that company and I decided that at the end of it that to sort of hone some further skills, um, I wanted to work in a manufacturer. I mean, not that I wasn't exposed to manufacturing within the first, um, within the first company, but there was almost a buffer between your design at that stage and then what was delivered because it went through a whole other series of channels um, which we were sort of involved in, the value engineering, budget driven, but I went through project managers, through principal clients, back through engineers, back to various signage companies. So sometimes the, the, the design was, the outcome of the design was slightly different to, um, to what you imagined it to be or what you documented it to be. And I wanted to know what that issue was or, or why that was happening. So I wanted to work at the cold face of design. Um, so I went to another local company, which was still quite signage based. Um, actually, before I do that, just some learnings, I guess, from the previous company was uh, working with brands like Commonwealth Bank and those ASX 500 company was really learned about professionalism. Um, formality and presentation was very important coming from, you know, university and, and jumping straight into those boardroom meetings was you know, quite a scary and terrifying phase, but it really helped um, sharpen skills very quickly. Um, but also recognising that not everyone you're delivering to or designing for understands design, then they don't all have the same mindset as you. So it was about learning to converse and document ideas in a manner that was informative and instructional to people outside design too. That was that was very important. Um, something else, uh, which I guess when you're at university, you know, you can deliver projects based on how much time you wish to invest into it. I mean, I remember staying up all night on projects um, sometimes, but within the company, within companies, you are your design time, you design for budgets, but also your design time is budgeted for. So you are you are given an allocation of time to work to. It could be four hours, it could be 40 hours, um, but the outcome of that design time needed to be successful. You, know, you needed to you needed to deliver something that not only you were happy with as a designer, but the client was happy with too, because that's ultimately who you were working for. 
Something else I found very important, which is sort of followed through my entire career, was to have dialogues and relationships about design, not only with clients, but with other staff, because you will end up following those people throughout your career as well. Um, you know, the industry's quite tight knit in some sense. It's large, but you'll notice that people sort of, you'll, you'll keep in contact with people throughout your entire career. Um, so back on the next job, working at the manufacturer, um, you know, there was no buffer in what we were doing. Um, there was no second stage of shop drawings. What we sort of designed on on screen um, went straight to the laser cutter or to the, the guys producing the molds or the, uh, in the, the guys downstairs assembling the thing. Um, so what was very important was your level of uh, finesse and detail to make sure that you weren't only designing for a beautiful render or something that ended up on page that but people were actually putting together because there's nothing worse than having the guys from downstairs come up and scream at you because you were 0.3 mil off on you know laser cutting a whole series of parts so that was a, a steep but very important um, learning curve and um, so we worked on amazing projects uh, there was a lot of documentation, as I said, and um, laboring over production files, but creative companies, creative consultancies started coming to us because, um, you know, we had this sort of skill set that could cross over from, you know, the concept all the way through. And so to share screen again quite quickly. Um, so we worked on projects, commercial building for NAB headquarters, uh, some signage designed by, designed by Pigeon, <coughs> and we were involved with sort of delivering this, I guess. So there's a whole sign suite of signs that sort of use this um, faceted circular tube. And it was about how do we deliver this? How do we come up with a way to make this work? And really it was that every single tube you see on every single sign was an individual piece that was five axis laser cut um, and met uh, sometimes in sort of a five spoke series and that they all had to be etched, um, that we designed custom parts to conceal within the tubes to mount signs, uh, sign panels too, as well as screens. So a super complex project I worked on with a with a whole team of designers. Um, you know, I think this was a 10 story building or something too, so you can imagine the quantity of signs involved. Um, this one here was conceptually designed by Emory Studios with Lions Architects. So they presented uh, us with some amazingly resolved elevations of what they wanted, you know, great, uh, graphic consultancy working um, aligned with an architect, the outcome's pretty amazing. So when it came to us, it was really about document, documenting it for build and what kind of value I could add to that rather than just sitting there and, and drawing the thing, the thing in SOLIDWORKS. So, you know, there was things like including the 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 company logo or the, the logo into the ventilation of the, the system itself, but also coming up with a manufacturing method that eliminated unnecessary processes. So I came up with a solution where rather than welding all these bits, complex bits together, it was all done on flat um, folded up sheet metal and it all hung together. So, you know, that was the value I added to something that was all an already defined project for me. Um, so the process along the way doesn't just go straight to SOLIDWORKS, you know, don't lose the skills of building things out of foam, form studies or, you know, building little samples even being on site to template some of the, um, you know, the complex facade work. All these things are part and parcel in sort of the design process when you're at a manufacturer, um, down to providing all the, the flat panels and then working with manufacturers about their work, um, defects and quality and things like that, really just striving for the best solution possible. Uh, but what was also able to, you know, aside from working on those complex detailing projects, was able to do very creative um, projects too, where uh, clients came to us to just imagine things for them. You know, um, some of these things were built, some of them weren't, but coming up with ideas for, you know, large facade treatments for Telstra Innovation Centre in the CBD. Or in QV, we were looking at sort of a sculptural series through the laneways at QV. Uh, based on the the naming of the laneways too. So this one was Artemis and there's this idea of Artemis being the mountains, Artemis also having a cape. So coming up with some kind of um, lighting installation that sort of represented both those things, um, but also had not only that connection with the building, but a sense of playfulness and fun. You know, the, that idea of kids um, playing bouncy ball in a, in a laneway, 
and it escaping. So this idea that the, the light became this sort of bouncing ball out, out of the laneway. Um, so that was a really fun time at, at a company called Adherence as well. And I guess from that, I, in hindsight, I might have gone to a creative consultancy if I could sort of have my time again to sort of just see that aspect of it. But I felt comfortable in myself to go out and sort of attempt freelancing as well. Um, so, <coughs> so I guess I've spent the last five years still in that same kind of space. Um, I still do those same kind of projects that I've always done, the signage and the wayfinding. As Will said, I'm slowly transitioning into more sort of public and public art and sculpture. Um, and I guess what was important in being able to transition into a freelance capacity was it was all about relationships. It was, it was about all the people that I'd known and worked for and communicated well with and, and done amazing things with and people with completely different skill sets than me, project managers, engineers, um, just developing relationships would allowed me to step outside that sort of full-time role and still, you know, work with multiple people as well. Um, so sharing my screen finally on some of the projects, I still do large scale signage, you know, this sky signs, which are mainly sort of documentation and engineering projects. Um, but, you know, sometimes people come to me and ask for small product development things. So leaning on that uh, initiative I've, I had taken in at here, it's developing that sort of folded sheet metal design for that AIA signage. I've never done sheet metal signage like that before. It allowed me to then translate that skill set into smaller um, boutique products for T2. And this was, you know, development of some what they called shelf talkers for their tea. Um, you can see them all sort of stacked up here. That allowed people to sort of take out the tins and, and smell the tea. Um, interchangeability of parts, um, single single components designed for disassembly, that kind of thing. Um, I really, as I said, I really have a passion for sort of um, spaces and sort of people's experience within spaces. So coming up with concepts, not always working in 3D programs, just Illustrator is an amazing quick program to sort of um, establish ideas once you're through that sketch stage. So coming up with ideas for visual merchandising, um, that one was obviously for a Christmas thing, which uh, both Will and I have found ourselves designing a number of Christmas decorations over the last couple of years, which is a really fun space to be in. And also there's, when you have downtime, when you're a freelancer, what do you do with that time? So self-initiated projects where I was coming up with um, sort of small, small lights myself, which I sort of produced a small run of, you know, just to put in uh, competitions or um, exhibitions as well as just have them around my house too. So what, how do you increase your skill set um, when you have downtime within as a freelance freelancer? Getting outside your comfort zone and um, just doing things that you don't normally do on a day-to-day -day basis is part and parcel with being a freelancer. So here I designed and built a, um, this is essentially a, a, a building model for a development, um, which the idea was as people came into the showroom, um, there was a small, Sort of abstracted version of the actual building itself so we had you know the pool up on the penthouse and, and the bar and these resin blocks representing various aspects of the building um, plus laser cut brass or water jet cut brass numerals which represented all the um, the apartments themselves and the idea was that once a person purchased one of these multi-million dollar apartments they this was a sort of a keepsake for them as well but also helped people within the showroom identify what apartments had been sold and what was still available. So there was levels to this um, this product itself, but a really fun one to be involved with. Um, and then sort of larger scale applications of you know, glass and light sculpture. So this is a project for the Blueprint, um, which was a concept by Brendan Van Heck, uh, which was based on, it's, it's an entrance into a train station in Sydney and it's really based on it's a lighting sculpture, a digital lighting sculpture based on um, timetable graphics. So you can imagine all the, the data sort of moving up and down. Um, so working with Space Cannon, who developed the lighting tubes themselves, the controllable lighting tubes, my role was to really just flesh out how this thing worked from a, a built perspective, from prototyping all the way through to install. It was a, it's a pretty complex um, com set of componentry. 
uh, you, this this image here kind of shows how each individual part was stacked on top of each other in a concealed manner. So you almost had to tie off each part in a ring as you worked your way up to the top. Um, but the results are pretty incredible. So again, working in a combination of Illustrator and sketches and SolidWorks um, to really sort of spread across and uh, invest time, invest the right amount of time in in the right stages of the project too is very important. Um, Will, this is one uh, that he and I collaborated on, and so this is some public art here, which was uh, pretty significant in terms of complexity. I know Will, sort of you did the the majority of the the heavy lifting lifting in terms of the complex SolidWorks work here, but essentially each one of these. Um, these oysters or these bird baths is about is a couple of ton and is five axes machined from sandstone and then it has an, a stainless steel inlay as well um, again another project collaboration with will same client um, blueprint i should say that this was a blueprint project with concept by black beetle same with this one too and sort of just defining how it was built um, plus how it was all configured, where did it sit in the environment too. So the conceptual designers knew what they wanted and had detailed them in sort of elevation, but you know, producing quick 3D models that the client could see how it sort of worked within the larger space was quite important. Um, and S, who I, I do a little bit of work for too, uh, all credit to them for this concept. This is um, a large lighting sort of installation which <clears throat> which I've shown the 3D model here, transitions up and under various stages of a, of a thoroughfare within a building. Um, so they had come up with the concept and even pro, you know, it's gone to a certain level of prototyping these light blades. And they brought me, brought me on for full documentation of the building and um, each of the components themselves. Very intensive, each one of these is an individual um, product so every single mounting was individualized every single aluminium um, face was custom done had to be etched uh, super complex um, but what you see here is the renders on this page and then these are actually screen snaps from a video of the outcome so you can see how how well it translated and that's full credit to an s2 for visual, visualizing something at the start and then sort of being able to sort of carry it through to to the finished product, maintaining that intent as well, which is great to be involved in. Um, so I think in terms of um, my work, that's all I have to show you at the moment. And um, uh, my experience, I hope that's sort of given you sort of a, a good kind of arc of, of what I do and what I've done. Um, I guess perhaps I could potentially talk about um, some of the, the points about being a freelancer. I sort of touched on some of the pros and cons or some insights or some important things to note. And um, one of those I mentioned earlier, and that is experience and relationship is key. So build that up, make sure you are getting outside your comfort zone, um, focus on developing dialogue with people outside your comfort zone, people who don't under understand design. As I said, not everyone is design minded, so really sharpen those skills. Um, a benefit of being a freelance designer is obviously the flexibility. I'm, I'm working from home, which obviously has changed since um, changed the game since COVID has come in place. A lot of people can work from home, but that was something very important to me, um, especially if you have a family as well. Um, but in juxtaposition to that, there is the in income insecurity. So you need to learn how to juggle or balance um, having a design career and potentially even uh, secondary income, working in hospitality when you sort of jump out of university. Um, on top of that, you also have to do all your own admin, all your own invoicing, your text, um, your tax. So everything comes down to you as a freelancer or a sole trader. You, um, it's really you or nothing. Um, something else that uh, is very important is that it's Every day you're outside your comfort zone because you never know what kind of project is going to come in when it comes in. So there's this, there's this whole sense of ambiguity about what you're going to be doing. And it's difficult, um, you know, every day you're doing something new. Um, but I guess the learnings that um, you've all had at three years of RMIT, where the focus of your learning has been um, primarily about collaboration and enhancing your individual strengths, 
along with self-efficacy and being and being investigative and showing your initiative in exploration really um, helps you sort of take comfort in that in that spot that you find yourself in. Um, so I know that probably the learnings you've undertaken with Will and Chitan um, sort of allow you to have a system um, within you that allows you to sort of tackle you know, the design world and those specific design tasks with you know, a mindset that allows you to be agile and, and go and seek information confidently and, and do your own research. Because a lot of the time as a freelancer, you are working in a, in a silo by yourself. Um, so it is, it is important to be able to do that. And I, I know you've all, you all have that learning at the moment. Um, but I guess also my, my final point to tackle um, working in a silo is just remember you're part of a design community. Um, so find people you connect with and have good rapport with and, and trust and keep them around. Um, find people with different skill sets to yours and lean on each other um, in your careers. That's that's what Will and I do in some sense when we work together. Um, in We have different skill sets, um, but we come together and we, we work really well. And um, so sure, I'm scrambling a, a lot of the days trying to find work, but when I get it, I would rather involve someone um, or even hand that job over to someone else if I know the end result will be a better um, solution or outcome, um, because that's essentially what it's all about. And if you develop these sort of connections and relationships with people in the design community, it'll all come back to you at some point, you know, maybe not in a year or five years, but these people will stay connected with you and um, you'll, you'll all grow in your design career together. Um, so I think that is my final and most important uh, point is just to stay connected and, and involved in your design um, design community. And uh, I guess that's all I have to say at the moment.